Hello and welcome. I'm Anna Danziger Halkren, Associate Director of the Center for Women's History here at New York Historical Society. Before we begin tonight's program, I would like to thank Louise Muir, our President and CEO, Agnes Shutang, Chair of the Board of Trustees, and Pam Schaffler, our Chair Emerita, as well as all of our trustees, Joyce B. Cowan, Diane Max and the late Adam Max, Jean Margot Reed and the Mellon Foundation, along with our Chairman's Council, our members, and our many other generous donors, none of the work of New York Historical would be possible without your continued and committed support. As the Associate Director, I am proud of the growth we've achieved here at the Center for Women's History. Our scholarship, education pro programs, collecting, and not least of all, exhibitions, all foreground women's critical role in American history. Tonight's program, What's In It? An Intimate History of Pockets, will run for approximately 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A. At any time during our program tonight, please submit your questions through the Q&A feature located on your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we can. And now I'm delighted to introduce our panelists for the evening. Hannah Carlson teaches dress history and material culture at the Rhode Island School of Design. After training as a conservator of costume and textiles at the Fashion Institute of Technology, she received a PhD in material culture from Boston University. She has contributed articles to Commonplace, the Journal of Early American Life, Dress, the Journal of the Costume Society of America, and MacGuffin, the Life of Things. Our moderator tonight and my colleague, Karen Ben Horan, is a fashion historian and a curatorial scholar at the Center for Women's History at the New York Historical Society, and also a doctoral candidate in history at New York University. She's the co-creator of the documentary film, Mrs. G, which won first prize at the Phoenix Art Museum Fashion Film Festival, and has curated several fashion exhibitions in New York and in Israel. Karen co-authored the Fashion History Survey, She's Got Legs, A History of Hemlines and Fashion, and edited the book, A Sweater, A History, both from Schiffler Press. We're thrilled to have Hannah and Karen with us today. I'll now turn it over to Karen to get the conversation started. Thank you so much, Anna. Good night, good evening. Hi, Hannah. Um, so first of all, congratulations on this new book, uh, on your publication, and I think one of the most uh, exciting aspects of your work is how you really bring together the material world and um, show this really complex story on how gender shapes our world. Um, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, on a personal note, I'm one of those people who um, in my daily life, I actually think quite a bit about pockets. Um, I, um, don't love carrying a bag and I always stuff my pockets and it's kind of like a running joke about me that I always leave the house without a bag but with a lot of pockets and I'm very passionate about having pockets and I'm sure it's something that you hear quite a bit now that you have this publication out. Um, so I wanted to first start with how did you even kind of decided to write a whole book about pockets? What made you interested in pockets uh, in the first place? Well, I think, um, I mean, it was a little bit like that. I mean, I, I have been a bag carrying person and there was this, you know, unexpected fire drill. And I found myself sort of on the street kind of looking around thinking, I can't make a phone call. I can't buy a cup of coffee. Everything I need is in my bag, which is, you know, draped over a chair in my office. And when I ran out, you know, I didn't have it. And it was that sort of feeling of being temporarily stranded and thinking, you know, oh, I know, I, I went like this, oh, you know, and I made that gesture that you make when you um, are locked out of your car or out of the front door. And I realized that that gesture says so much about our expectation that, you know, we will carry objects with us. Um, and that made me think, you know, why is women, why does women's wear so often fall down on the job? Um, so that was sort of the, that's the short answer. I don't know if we have time for the long answer, but the long answer is I was also teaching uh, about Robinson Crusoe and castaways that, that. And how does that relate to well, pockets? Well, I mean, Defoe thinks a lot about, you know, unexpected, um, uh, you know, getting lost, you know, without much stuff. Um, 
And there was this scene that just got to me. Um, you know, Robinson Crusoe arrives on, he's wrecked, he arrives on his lonely island and he has, I think, a pocket knife, some tobacco and a little tobacco in a pouch or a pipe, I'm sorry. And it's not enough to survive. I mean, that's just too little. Um, and so Defoe engineers this like rescue. Crusoe wakes up the next day. He sees his ship has foundered like half a mile away. He says, okay. He strips his clothes. He swims to the boat. He stuffs his pockets full of like some food, like biscuits, the hard tack that sailors eat. And he swims back to shore. And this was a huge joke in the 1720s. People thought it was hysterical that um, uh, that Crusoe had been, you know, swam to shore naked, his pockets full of biscuits. And I just love that idea that the pocket is so naturalized for men that you could- It's almost part of their body. Yeah, <laughs> strip yourself, you know, like on shore and then sort of like, on, you know, like just expect to have the pockets at your disposal. Yeah. So before we get like really deep into that, I uh, you write into introduction that pockets are the only functional part of clothing that does not contribute in some way to the project of dressing the body. Unlike zippers, lacing buttons, belt loops, pockets do not help us put on, take off, or adjust the fit of our clothes. So I wanted to start with actually kind of defining what is a pocket and how did the definition evolve or change over time? Yeah, you know, it took me sort of an astonishingly long time to figure figure that out. Like pockets are not like every other functional bit of clothing. They're this funny adjunct. Um, and I think the word pocket just, just as a definition means little bag. And um, that comes from the French, so posh is bag, and as it was pronounced in Anglo-Norman, you know, in the medieval area era, it was poke. So poke plus et, you know, like a cigarette as a small, a small bag. So pockets were initially just like small bags and they weren't attached to our clothing. And that was sort of the mystery. Like, why do they become attached and when? And um, how then are they different than bags, you know? They, they're very much the same, a pocket and a bag. They, you know, they both carry stuff. And yet I, I discovered that they're really quite different. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry, I was just... Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you have maybe example, like uh, if you want to share your uh, PowerPoint to show us a few oh, examples. Oh, sure, 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 sure. Yep. So screen, share screen. Um... Is it gonna let me share view? Okay, so there's the title, book page. Um, I think we sort of passed that by. That's yeah. that on um, that note, that feeling that that pockets are part of our bodies. That's our little kangaroo, which <laughs> and I love. That. I love the kangaroo. Um, so here's this early moment, um, and everyone carries bags. I mean, bags are fashionable. Bags are fashionable for men and women, and men wear purses in the medieval era, and they're like a status symbol, and they were highly ornate, and you would, to make it even more sort of dashing, put that dagger um, through a slit in the purse, and it was called a dagger purse. Um, so women also wear bags, but they sort of have them tied um, around a girdle or a belt, and they just kind of hang low, and so everybody wears bags. Um, and it's a really sort of late innovation of tailoring where I think, I think a tailor just said, you know, this bag right at the hip, I, I, it's just kind of getting in the way. Let me stick it inside my clothes. You know, it mm -hmm, seems sort of mm -hmm. um, like it wasn't some great invention and it was, it was, seems a little slightly haphazard, but as you see in the image on your right, you know, in the 1540s, men begin to wear bifurcated dress. The first sort of pants are called breeches or trunk hose, and they're really puffy. They're like, you know, big pumpkins. And this is where the first pockets sort of fit in, in this really big sort of area of men's breeches. Um, and so uh, that's the that's the kind of, the, there's the split, that's the moment. And they go first into men's wear. 
And so I just want to ask you quickly, so on the left side, the image that we're seeing, essentially, the, that little red thing would is the purse or like what was then the pocket, right? Function as a the, 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 woman. the woman, yeah. Yeah, so she's wearing it under her dress, like between her underskirt and her dress, and she's hiked up her dress to show off the purse. Mm -hmm. And the purse and how it's, you know, Chaucer notes that, it was sexy to see how women had their belts around their waist and then to think about women walking. So imagine that she is actually walking and her purse is gonna kind of sway and swing. And um, uh, I think it's Chaucer has the, I can't remember, it's Allison, who the wife who is um, in the, I can't remember which tale, I'm sorry, but <laughs> that's but but that's the, like, it's sexy, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How, you, how you wear your bag. Um, there were these cross-dressing women at a tournament and some medieval chronicler was really upset because the woman had a bag that she tied around her waist and she put a dagger through it and that was considered like really risque. So it's clearly gendered. We have always carried things and they're, it's always sort of gendered, which is, I think, fascinating. So on that note, can you explain how pockets are suddenly becoming tied to masculinity and why? Well, so I think first is that the place they go in breaches. Um, but then I think actually, you know, I'm guessing, I don't know entirely, but um, one of the first objects to be scaled to fit into pockets are weapons. Um, there was this sort of major innovation in um, uh, pistols. So the wheel lock mechanism allowed the gun to become small and it was actually called a pocket pistol. So before then, I think guns had been several feet long and you had to like stop and use two hands and light a taper to, in order to set the gun to start. The wheel lock mechanism allowed you to basically put your gun in your pocket um, and this freaked out all sorts of uh, rulers, for example. And, you know, during the first assassination of a major world figure by a handgun, it looked as though the assassin sort of paused and reached into his pocket as if to hand the ruler a letter and instead takes out this gun. So I think maybe the sensational aspect of this pocket scaled object helps link uh, the pocket to masculinity to 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 menswear. I mean, that's what, just a guess. Yeah, and what about that notion of you know men have privileges that women do not have in how they can move around or the kind of access that they have to knowledge and education and how, is that is that also something that's tied or related to this like pocket privilege in in a way? I mean, I think certainly, and I think that really, um, that really becomes, I think, more historically sort of clear when we get into the 17th and 18th century with the, with the suit. And so instead of that two-piece, so here's our little prince, right? He's wearing a two-piece doublet and breeches, and that evolves eventually into the three-piece suit. And pockets start to really proliferate. Um, and it's almost as though the suit is like this, um, what's the word? It's like a um, proxy, it's like a like a portable storehouse. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, like you could move around with all this sort of stuff. Um, so here's our gentleman in a suit, but then on the left, no, I'm sorry, the right is, um, is this mathematician. It's a playing card advertisement from 1702. And you see all the instruments that this mathematician might need, and also all the cases that are going to keep those protected. Um, and I think, you know, you, you suddenly have this, um, well, let me say that Thomas Jefferson was called a um, walking calculator by his contemporaries, because he would walk around and he had like miniature um, what did he have? A thermometer, a surveying compass, a cal uh, what's it called? A pocket sextant, a level, a notepad. And it was as though like he could see and map and measure his world. Um, and I think 
Um, enlightenment scholars say that um, knowing requires tooling. And here you have modern man on the go with all the tools he needs, all these miniaturized instruments um, all the way through his suit. And they're kind of organized. Like you could have, you know, you always keep certain things in certain places. As you were talking, you know, I'm looking at the image and, you know, it's almost like he's flaunting his pockets, <laughs> kind of showing right. them sure off. Yeah. But I'm also thinking as you're talking about this idea of like men can need the pocket or have the, the privilege of having pockets because they're out in the world or, you know, leaving the house, they're mobile, they go around. Women maybe don't need it as much because they are in the home uh, where they should be during that time period. Uh, in in a sense, maybe that's kind of like the the built in message of this pocket privilege. Um, so from kind of that, um, you know, thinking about kind of who has the knowledge, who has the pocket privilege, who can um, move around. Can you? like talk about like who doesn't have that privilege like who doesn't have pockets during this time period yeah and I why mean, I mean I think that so I should say that I think women are carrying lots of objects and I'll show you in a little bit they didn't have inside pockets but they carried stuff around but I think clothing um sort of what's the word it like telegraphs who is mobile and who who gets to be this sort of adventurer so for example um uh enslaved people um did not often have uh pockets decorating the suit like our our man uh, on the left um and that's evident because of runaway slave advertisements so uh enslavers would post descriptions these paragraph long descriptions in the newspapers um uh, you know, asking for the return of servants and slaves. And a number of these advertisements describe clothing really, really uh, clearly. And for, for 18th century dress historians, these advertisements are like a, a gold mine of information about everyday dress. Um, and in several cases, there are these sort of indications that, you know, you know, Edom left in 1770 from Virginia, but before he did, he dyed his white wool coat brown and added pockets and pocket flaps. And so that sort of evidence suggests that actually, you know, pockets are useful for flight, but they also would be useful to look, you know, to have somebody look actually, you know, pass as a free man was the sort of concern in the uh, runaway advertisements. You could look not like, you know, not sort of wearing um, the, sort of awful uh, garb of the enslaved, but more like a gentleman in a pocketed coat, in a coat that's fashionable. Uh, so, okay, so there's, and then we've got, of course, um, who else? Um, um, so these are some objects in pockets, but you know, then of course, um, women also in the 18th century don't have a visible sort of pocket flap suggesting that they can move through the world. Um, and so, but I, I should say that, you know, for a long time, women are perfectly happy not to have an inset pocket because they have a high on pocket. And that's the image on the right. I cannot tell my left from my right. That's the image on the right. <laughs> yes. and, and so you would tie those around your waist and maybe one or two, and you reach through your skirts, a slit in your skirt to this um, really capacious, you know, tie on pocket. And, um, and it's quite beautifully decorated, and even though it was hidden. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And women would decorate them for, for each other and give them as gifts. Um, Barbara Berman and uh, Ariane Fentineau have written a beautiful book about the about the tie on pocket. I think it's called The Pocket, A Hidden History of Women's Lives. So, that, you know, that's something to take a look at. Um, but, you know, once fashion changes by about 1800, there's no more room to keep pockets under your skirt once you have that columnar sort of um shape uh during the revolutionary period uh so like think of like so then they come out essentially they come out right so underwear becomes the first fashion handbag mm -hmm. and so here is um the seven-year-old harriet uh, campbell of new york 
um, you know, with the props that the painter, itinerant painter gave her. And she quite elegantly is holding, you know, not only an umbrella, but a reticule. And so that's the first mm -hmm. sort of cloth mm -hmm. fashion in the day. Um, and so there's all sorts of commentary about, you know, oh my God, now women are carrying their pockets in their hands. These, you know, this is, it was made fun of. People called it the reticule. It's also called a ridicule. I think maybe because it was so small and because, I don't know, but there starts to be this sort of commentary and this slight comedic, you know, dissension and making fun of women for always ne not having what they need. Mm -hmm. So we, you, you know, you mentioned and you showed us a few objects that people might carry in their pockets, but what about hands? <laughs> I mean, is there any kind of specific meaning or kind of a gendered kind of social convention tied to putting your hands in your pockets? So I loved writing about, um, about this, about gesture. And I think we think of pockets as really to hold things, but it was almost the most expressive, one of the most expressive gestures you can make is holding your hands in your pockets and looking really, you know, cool. And here's the first image I could find uh, of a courtier in France in the 1680s on the left. Um, and this is a pose I think that's still familiar. I mean, that looks like you, you, we, we, we know that guy, you know. Um, it's quite amazing how early this um, image is and well, showing almost, that gesture. It's almost like as soon as you get the suit and the suit is 1666, new clothes invite new attitudes and new movement. Before, you know, when you have those trunk hose, it was like, it was like a, hard to get your hand in there, you know? And I think breaches for the first time there, you know, at the uh, seam, at the side seam, and it's an envelope shape, not a bag shape. And so the pocket, as clothes are developing, pockets are also changing shape. But, you know, this courtier is trying to show how to be cool while you're rude, because it's, of course, a rude gesture, because um, pockets, um, you know, by the trousers, they're near the genital area. Um, as the poet um, Harold Nemirov said, um, pockets, um, they, they locate to lust. They're dark spaces over and around the erogenous zones. And so, you know, you have the lecherous guy over here on the right um, and, you know, he's watching as Maul is sold into prostitution and you know that he's thinking gross thoughts as he's got his hand in his pocket. So it's considered rude, but of course, because fashion always wants to poke at the dominant sort of um, morality, you know, it's also for the elite really, uh, you know, it's okay to break the rules. And I think we're used to that, you know, during this at Me Too era, right? That masculine privilege uh, sometimes is flaunted through breaking certain rules. What about women in that context? What about women and their hands in their pockets? You, you never, you do not see that gesture. Uh, I have found a couple in the 19th century when there are inset pockets um, when with the big skirts of the 19th century, you begin to see a couple once in a while, but it's just not, um, it's so rare. Um, let's see that. The, so here is, um, an 1890, um, uh, cabinet card and it's a photograph. I think maybe they were in an amateur theatrical or maybe a call a collegiate theatrical and you see, um, they're dressing up as men and, you know, the, the thing that really makes it work is that they take on these masculine gestures as well. And there's a lot of commentary in Godey's magazine and that's saying things like, you know, you know, when there's this discussion about why women should not wear, say, pants, for example, the idea is that they'll become rude like men and do things like hold their hands in their pockets. You know, there's that sort of funny commentary. But I think, you know, when you see, when you see something like, you know, I think it's Whitman in particular who really shifts the gesture from rude and vulgar to absolutely cool, you yeah. know, 
Um, cool, intellectual, cool. Yeah, like sexy, but also cool. Mm -hmm, and I think mm -hmm. that for me to try to figure that out, I sort of realized, oh, there's this whole realm of etiquette where that governs how you can use your hands. Um, but there's also this whole sort of realm of oratory and what it means to how you know how you speak. So I'm someone who like <laughs> is always gesturing. But um, I think in in for the Greeks, um, there was this gesture where you put your hand under your toga, and that was sort of meant restraint. And then there were some people who spoke with their hands, and um, that was unrestrained. Um, and so in oratory, the sort of the metaphor of putting your hand into your and folding your hand into your clothes, I think also suggests um, a, a way that you are um, not engaging with people, that you're sort of, um, it becomes a metaphoric notion about how you're removed. Your hand is removed into your pocket and you too are inaccessible. You are, um, so in sort of shifting between sort of sexy and removed, I think that's our notion of cool today in a way. It's very interesting. You know, it occurred to me as I was kind of reading the book that in periods where kind of large and decorative pockets are in fashion, um, they often that emerge from anti-fashion movements. Um, so where where pockets are seen as um, a product of function. Um, I'm thinking, for example, about war, uh, World War II, uh, when women's fashion is kind of dominated by this kind of like military style with lots of patch pockets, or even the 90s when we kind of get like cargo pants coming from kind of skater um, culture. Um, what did you find in your research about how pocket design relates to fashion trends more generally? You touched a little bit about that, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about oh, okay. that relationship. I mean, I think, um, <laughs> so, I mean, this is the only image I have for us. I mean, I have lots more than the book, but I think, um, or just women. buy the book. What? <laughs> I'm no, telling no. people to just buy the book. <laughs> the, um, the, um, oh no, it's just a pleasure to be here. This is really super fun. Um, I think pockets are considered, you know, in the 20th century, women's wear discovers pockets. It's, you know, Vogue calls pockets the new, uh, a new decorative element. And I think, um, they come out, for example, in military fashions, as you suggested, it's, it's a way for say, uh, women to look just as prepared as men. It's almost like, um, uh, you know, wanting to look efficient and ready. And so you can see these big pockets sort of come up in women's wear as well. Um, but there's also, I think what interested me as well was that um, designers, um, that for designers, pockets aren't merely decorative. I think someone like Scaparelli, um, you know, you know, for her, once a functional element comes into use, it can also come into play. Um, and so in this, uh, you know, she often worked with Salvador Dali and they had many um, collaborations. Um, and in this collaboration, you know, Dali said, oh, what if a woman uh, is like a, bureau drawer and, you know, invented all these drawers that came out. Her interpretation was, let me make a suit that um, has pockets that look like bureau drawers. Not all of those pockets worked, only some of them worked. Um, and I think she is like making a claim about how drawers are not psychosexual the way Dali does, but really important private space. We need to keep secrets. We need to have private space in public. Only the wearer knew which pocket actually worked, where her secrets could be kept. Um, and I think, you know, on the, and so I think she's using the decorative to make actually conceptual sort of points. Remember that Dior said, Christian Dior, the designer of the fifties said, 
Men have pockets to put things in. Women have pockets for decoration. I think someone like Schiaparelli says, yeah, and I'm going to play with those pockets. And, and actually, there's a point to that play. This, you know, and I, so I think, um, so I think designers have had a field day, you know, thinking about how pockets should look. Um, sometimes pockets react to the body. You know, for example, this pocket, these pockets, the joke is, that these are, she is a chest of drawers. And so you wonder, where are her nipples? Where's the belly button, right? Scaparelli is always interested in showing the fetishistic possibility of dress. The dress relates to the body underneath. Um, so on many levels, I think designers have, have used these decorative pockets to, to, you know, to play around and make their clothes more meaningful. And it's interesting you mentioned that this idea of like intimacy with the pockets and the pockets as this like, private space and it relates to your 18th century example where you're showing a pocket that you know it's decorative and it's beautiful but it's a it's a woman's private space as well um so it's kind of like almost like the same thread carried throughout but has you know now it's on the outside um and it's played with in this in this beautiful way um, I was wondering, you you showed before an interesting image of a soldier. Um, so I maybe we can go, go yeah, back yeah, to that yeah. and you can talk a little bit about that because that looked really interesting. So I guess, so I think what was fascinating to me um, was that I think we tend to think about um, the hubbub about whether women have useful pockets as a recent sort of social media phenomenon. And, but it's actually... It goes on for several centuries. The New York Times said, you know, men's clothes are full of pockets. Women have don't, don't have enough. So it's, I'm sorry, I think I got distracted by my image. So it's been for a while. It, you know, women have made complaints about pockets. And um, especially during the suffrage era, there was a lot of discussion about it. And I think um, that we think that, um, I'm sorry, that's my cat. We think that, um, uh, what's the word? That the military would be great at including functional uh, functional part of dress. But actually during World War II, when this image uh, is produced, um, the military had very little experience making women's wear. They made a, you know, a few nurses outfits. Um, and sort of ideas about women's place trump utility, even in this first sort of uniform. So the uh, why is she carrying a pocketbook to war? That was my question, like, what's going on? And, you know, it looks like she's going to the grocery store or something and she's leading the phalanx of women. Um, so, you know, and the purse, why would you carry a purse to war? So I read this uh, wonderful uh, history of the wax written by a woman who was herself a wax in 1952. And she has this really funny story about the fact that that purse was this terrible compromise. And it was a compromise because military designers said, you know, let's test out these breasts. These, first of all, we're gonna wear skirts because we don't want anyone to be worried that military going into the military will make you a lesbian, an Amazon, you know, a prostitute. So let's keep everyone looking feminine. Then they tested the suit jacket and they put cigarettes in the breast pocket and didn't like the way they looked. So military designers said, you know what? We're gonna get make a rule. You cannot carry anything in those breast pockets. And then the next thing they said was, actually, we're just gonna leave the pocket flap and we're not gonna have a real pocket. So you can put your, metals on your pocket flap, but you can't carry anything. So now there's a skirt without pockets, a jacket with fake pocket flaps and no way to carry anything. And so military designers like had to fool around with designing this really stupid purse, you know, that was kept sliding off and that wouldn't stay on your body. So that was- That's pretty incredible, you know, to think that, you know, they, they favored essentially, you know, kind of maintaining the idea of femininity over the function of what women needed to actually go and, and serve. Exactly. And so I think that's like key evidence that ideas, entrenched ideas 
come through in material culture like this. You know, there's, um, we, we have ideas about gender that are sort of amorphous, but when we design and make things, those ideas are revealed. You know, like to make ideas true, we make objects. And those objects, I think that's why I love studying objects. And I think they, um, they say things that we don't say out loud. In World War II, we weren't going to say, we're going to send you to war, but we don't really want you to be able to carry everything you need, you know? Yeah. And you mentioned in passing the suffragists, and um, I read in your book, like, I was surprised to find in the book, like, how preoccupied suffragists were with pockets and the idea of, you know, going back to this idea of pocket privilege. Can you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, I mean, maybe I emphasized it just because, of course, it was about pockets. They might not have been that obsessed, but um, suffragists, um, you know, um, understood that, um, uh, you know, without pockets, you were not prepared for the real contest. And this is a quote from The Wind in the Willows, a children's book. And women began to demand pockets, uh, suffragists, and they talked about it. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, for example, you know, talked a lot about how women in corsets and long trailing skirts were not as free to move around. And she was really upset to see, um, you know, she had these discussions with her dressmaker insisting that her dressmaker include pockets. And her dressmaker didn't. And she was, you know, she wrote several articles about this. So, uh, the image on the left sort of refers to how much um, it, it's a book of suffrage rhymes and it was sort of a satire and it um, linked the vote to pockets. There were some anti-suffragists who said, you know, maybe suffragists are so upset about, maybe, maybe the thing they're really upset about is pockets and not the vote. You know, so there was this like, let's give them pockets and let's not worry about the vote. But anyway, um, Alice Miller wrote this very sweet, funny book um, in which she satirized all the art, the anti-suffragist arguments. And so in this poem, why we oppose pockets for women, um, the, real, the real upset was why we oppose votes for women, but she substituted votes for pockets. And I'm so sorry, you see how ridiculous um, either, you know, that anything could be um, naturalized like that, you know. Um, we shouldn't have pockets because it's not a natural right, you know, was I think she was suggesting that neither the vote nor the pocket was a natural right. And that um, um, when we rely on these sort of circular arguments to keep the status quo going, uh, we get this kind of thinking and then we're stuck. Um, with this sort of thinking. I'm sorry, I think I got distracted. Was that the, yeah. the suffragists yeah. were upset? You know, they wanted functional clothing um, and they wanted pockets. People started making fun of them for that desire. And then here you have something like the satire. <laughs> um, before we open it up for questions, and I'm sure we'll get a bunch of them, um, I wanted to ask you, and I'm, I'm sure you you get that quite a bit, this question about, you know, what, was there anything that really surprised you in the course of doing this research or maybe something that made you look differently on, you know, something that you thought you knew everything about and just kind of changed what you thought you knew? Um, well, I think one thing, I was just surprised that there was so much evidence Um I was surprised that there was this discussion um, about, you know, what we hold and what our pockets look like in so many arenas that it's satire, theater, literature, fashion images, that there was just so much discussion. And um, I think maybe I thought that we walk around in the world and we're, we feel self-possessed, we feel self-sufficient, but actually, that self-sufficiency, I think, really depends on all of these objects. And that, those objects are the result of 
generations of people and designers and imaginative thinkers making these things. And I think there's just a little bit of, oh, when you walk out the door and say oh, goodbye, it's, you feel confident, but actually, I think it was humbling to think, oh, actually we rely on the work of so many people. You know, I have my phone. Do you know how that phone works? No, but when I walk out the door, I feel connected to people. I know I can find my way. I know that I know the weather, you know, like I have all of this information that I feel confident about. But the fact that I can carry it and that all sorts of generations of people have made it, I think is what, I don't know, like it struck me that, ah, you know, first of all, clothes aren't just about the look, that when we move through the world, we need all this stuff and that it's not about me, you know, like we, 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 we feel confident, but maybe we're not so, um, we, we require lots of help, lots of objects. Uh, um, last question before I, I open it up, but um, in this perhaps um, goes kind of beyond the scope of your book, but I wanted to ask you, um, and you touch a little bit about that, like pockets versus handbags. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a period where you think kind of abundance of pockets trumped handbags or vice versa when, you know, there's handbags are kind of fashionable, important that it makes pockets less so? Um, memories of COVID Zoom. Um, so I think, I think the pocket bag distinction is almost, is the second, second most gender distinction as skirt trouser. Um, I think, you know, the suffragists called, called bags, um, this terrible burden, this sort of, um, you know, they were like, uh, a badge of servitude. Um, and I think, you know, there are moments when, as you said, we need bag, we, we don't, well, I'm sorry. What is the question, what, how should we think about the per pocket purse distinction? Well, I more I'm thinking about whether like our periods when handbags are kind of like super in fashion, do we see less attention to pockets or when and you know like in the 1940s when we get these women's suits with all those patch pockets and or in the 90s where you get cargo pants where handbags less important and again this per perhaps might be beyond the scope of what you covered but i was just it's something that i'm just curious about to hear from you like is there a tension between those two things or they are actually substitute to one another or are there two different things I think there's, I think there is definitely a tension, but I think actually the purse always wins out. The bag always wins. And I think the reason for that is, you know, pockets come and go in women's wear and you don't, you can't depend on them. That's one thing. But the other thing is that bags are so critical to the fashion industry. And I don't want to sound like a um, conspiratorialist, <laughs> conspiracy theorist, <laughs> but um for example, Diana Vreeland was the editor of an editor newly arrived at Harper's Bazaar in 1937. And she was in the hall one day and she said to an editor, oh, I have a great idea. I hate my handbag. It's this bloody old handbag is just a pain to carry. When I walk, women walk differently when they have to carry a handbag. I want to devote a whole issue to pockets. This editor ran to the editor-in-chief. The editor-in-chief called Diana Reland into her office and said, what are you saying? Do you know this whole magazine depends on the advertising revenue from, from po the pocketbook from purses? We are not, you know, having a whole issue devoted to what you can do with pockets. And so, um, you know, I, I don't have any proof of that. I can't show that exactly, but I think seriously, um, you know, perfume and handbags are really the drivers sort of that that's what keeps the fashion industry stable. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't, I think actually what's happening is that menswear is falling in love with new bags. And there's all sorts of, all sorts of, um, you know, some that 
look like they're over the shoulder, some that look like fancy sort of hip things. Um, I think men will achieve wearing great looking bags before women's wear is devoted to, to parody, uh, pocket parody. Yeah, thank you. So um, if our audience have questions, they're welcome to put them in the Q&A. And we already have a question. Um, if you can maybe talk about pockets as places of comfort and warmth, it's an audience question. I think um, that they, first of all, they also make you feel secure. There are a couple of different ways they, I think, make you feel secure. One is certainly the objects you carry in pockets sometimes have no functional benefit and they, they can be these wonderful sort of, um, you know, they're a container for the self. And when you rediscover what you've held in your pockets, I think you, it's like sort of a memory treasure box of, oh, look what I left in my coat last winter. You know, I had that pebble from the beach. I had, um, oh, I wonder, I never called that number on this matchbook. I mean, I think there's this sense of who you carry almost an archive of yourself sometimes in your pockets. Um, but then certainly too, when you hold your hands in your pockets, you do that so that you don't feel nervous and anxious. I mean, I didn't talk about how much pockets, um, you, you feel secure when you have somewhere to hold your hands if you're feeling anxious at a cocktail party. I mean, I think that's another another thing certainly and certainly relate to this idea of how pockets or the clothing kind of um, shape our posture um, and the attitude it really relates to both of those um, but also the examples that you gave before um, mm -hmm. and to this question so we have another question um, mm -hmm. have there been changes to the placement and shape of men's pockets over the last 300 years or have they remained more or less the same? No, they have certainly changed. So there are um, all sorts of ways that, um, you know, pockets, especially in the suit, um, really, really shift around. So in the 1770s, um, there were these fashionable young men called the macaroni, and they wanted really, really slim coats. Um, and they were so slim that the hip pocket sort of disappears for a while. So the tailors say, ah, oh, we can't have no pockets. So the interior breast coat pocket is invented. Um, when tails are really long, uh, there are incredible um, pockets in the tail coat. You could fit a lot, you know, back there. Um, sportswear has, and, and military gear has really influenced menswear. Um, now we we're sort of used to having a lot of clothing that's uh, like with super fun zippers that's now all over our arms. Now we have pockets in spandex leggings. It looks like this, you know, the seam around your leg has a place for a pocket. I mean, I think as our clothes change, we have new places for pockets. And that's certainly, I think, throughout the whole, throughout the whole history. This actually ties beautifully to the next question that we got. Um, what is your take on athleisure and pockets disappearing from less structured attire? And what is your opinion on the fanny pack and pockets moving externally? I mean, I think that the athleisure, yeah, it's like, it's so drapey. I mean, you really, like when it's so unstructured, you know how you think, oh, I don't want to, well, it almost looks like, um, what is it when a snake eats something and then you can see the food moving through that body? Uh, like, a, what are those snakes called? The... Uh, I'm sure there's a word for that. A word <laughs> but for we, that. we all have that image in our mind. Yeah. You know, like when, when you see someone with athleisure and they've got something in their hip pocket, you're almost like, I don't want to, it's too, I can see the whole outline is too much. Um, and uh, so, and I, I mean, I think the fanny pack, there, there are really elevated versions of the fanny pack these days. I mean, people do not make fun of it anymore. And I think actually the more fashionable place to wear it is like, like this way. You know, you see lots of versions of the chic fanny pack worn over one shoulder. Uh, and, you know, that seems like a, your hands are free that way. I think the distinction seems to be that pocketbook always took up the, like, took up your hand. And 
the psychic energy it takes to keep track of a handbag is modified in something like a fanny pack, whichever way you wear it. it it's almost like the fanny, the fanny pack is an external pocket in a sense, because it yes. doesn't require that like holding and, and, and handling. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we got a, another interesting um, question. Are there personal items that have been shaped or designed specifically to fit into pockets and have pockets shaped the design of other objects? Yes. I mean, I, I certainly, I think so. I mean, I think um, there are um, objects that have been miniaturized to fit into pockets. Um, so I think I know more about the evidence of clothing. So for example, the pocket watch. Um, pocket watches are not worn on the wrist until about World War I. And before that, they fit into the fob pocket, which is a slit in the waistband. And that's where it that's where it went because you could sort of reach it. Notably, women don't have portable technology like that and wore watches almost like jewelry because they had, they did not have a fob pocket. Um, there's pockets for tickets. And in the 19th century, with all of riding the train, you could, it was tiny, it was underneath like this, I, th I think it was right here, and you pull it out, you don't have to search around, it's right there for your ticket. There's pockets that you put um, at your back in sportswear in the 19th century also, and it was called uh, for game, like a poacher's pocket. So illegal, you know, something just a big, you'd hide a big bird in there just because it's nice and big. So pockets, the shapes of pockets accept different sorts of objects, I think, absolutely. Um, I don't think pistols were shaped in order to be put in pockets, but they certainly become associated with one another in the 16th century. Um, I wonder about the cigarette, you know, was the cigarette a way to, I don't know the history of that, so I, I, I shouldn't say anything. I mean, I was curious about that, but I think, um, uh, yes. Pockets change, objects change to fit there. Um, someone is asking about the Chatelaine. So can you, maybe people don't know what it, what that is and maybe you can talk about it and how that relates to pockets. So the Chatelaine is like a, um, it's like a beautiful decorative, um, you know, a chain, like a, is it is it a purse or is it a chain that holds other objects? Um, but what it suggests is that women's wear, women wear it, and it's like a beautifully decorative, I'm sort of, I think it's both a purse and like you might have little chains that carry your keys and things like that. Um, and it's yeah. like jewelry and you wear it at your belt and it's accessible, the objects are accessible because you can't hold it in a pocket. And I think mm -hmm. it's made beautiful so that um, you, uh, because it's worn. In yeah, essence, it's worn on the body. outside. Yeah. And it's a set of symbol that women carry around and yeah. sort of like also represent a woman's ability to kind of, you know, be yeah. the, the lady of the house or managing. Um, our last question, um, when did women keep um, in pocket, in their pockets through, what did women keep in their pockets through the years? Were there any popular items that people put in their pockets? Yes. So, um, uh, I mean, I think women carry things as idiosyncratic as men, you know, there's, um, uh, in the revolutionary war, there was a diarist who said, oh, they stole my mother's pocket. They took objects out of it, including, um, you know, little baby's caps that she had knitted, right? So people carry everything. Women often carried lots of sewing things. Um, they were called housewives. So you could always be at work. You know, if for the child in the 19th century, the pocket knife was the thing Tom Sawyer most wanted, um, a pocket thimble were the things most carried by girls. Um, uh, you know, Alice in Wonderland complained about this, um, you know, that, uh, so I would say that the objects that you carry are gendered, but that there's also just such a variety and that um, uh, you could, whether you had uh, a pocket or a tie on pocket, um, you, you know, it was sort of endless, the objects that you could carry. I, I hope, sorry, I hope that, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, and I'll, uh, 
in, since we have a, a, two more minutes, I'll ask you my last question, actually, that I, I was wondering as you were talking, um, you talked a little bit about like construction and, you know, that move from a tine to a, like a sewn pocket and, and different placement of pockets. Have there been any recent innovations in pocket construction? Um, I mean, I think I, I think finally everyone is really happy that if you wear tight, tight leggings, you can have a pocket in your, you know, have you seen uh, young teenagers, <laughs> what's that, you know, holding your phone, walking down the street, and it's just so infuriating. Um, I think the technical gear and technical wear have amazing, um, innovative pockets. Um, I think the question will be, will we still need pockets when um, the world is totally wired and we have clothing made out of smart textiles, but I think we always will. There is no such thing as a digital pocket handkerchief. And I think we will always need some kind of way to carry uh, carry what we need. That's all the time we have for tonight, unfortunately. I wanna thank Hannah and Karen for this fascinating conversation. Um, and for all of you uh, listening for, for joining us this evening as well. Please sign up for the museum's mailing list and follow us at nyhistory.org to get the latest on upcoming salons just like this one, as well as our social media handle, NY History. The New York Historical Society is currently open Tuesday through Sunday. You can reserve your timed entry museum tickets on our website, and we hope to see you on Central Park West to see our exhibition, Women's Work, on view in the Joyce B. Cowan Women's History Gal Gallery through August 2024. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening.